Good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode 69 of the On Air Advocate, where at the On Air Advocate, we look to provide education, support, and empowerment for all of those with different abilities, mental and medical illnesses, and their caregivers. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Tammy Flynn, and I am the host and producer of the On Air Advocate, and I am super excited that you are joining us here this evening, or if you are catching this on the replay as well. Now, as you know, over here at the On Air Advocate, any information that we may give on a weekly basis. If you think it could be relevant or helpful for anyone else, please hit the share button and share the love. So for those of you who have been following us this last few weeks, we have been covering back to school, and that's in so many different capacities. But tonight is one that is one of my favorite, and I have one of my favorite people back here on the show with us tonight, our favorite pharmacist, as well as the producer of the Pharmacist Answers podcast, Cynthia Hendricks. Hey, Cynthia. Hi, Tammy. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. And I think that what you have to bring to the table tonight for back to school is so relevant for so many parents um, mm -hmm. that have kiddos that suffer with anaphylactic food allergies or allergies of any sort who have to take meds while they're at school. Maybe they have kids that have type 1 diabetes. I mean, so many different topics. So... I am excited that you're here to give us info and yeah. um, information. Well, there's definitely things that go through my mind professionally when I know back to school season is coming and I know school starts at different times for different people throughout the country. So here in Georgia, um, I'm a first time kindergarten mom now. <laughs> um, and she's been in, she's been in school for three weeks now, or this is her third week. So we've okay. already been in school for a while. So I had to do a lot of this prepping and thinking and school supplies and all that stuff um, in July. And, but now I know a lot of people don't start school until after Labor Day. So here right. we are coming to the end of August and we're like one more holiday weekend. And then like, it's mm -hmm. all like boots it's on the all ground. In. <laughs> so, yeah. And so, um, so there's a lot of things that we have to start thinking about because some parents, we see some parents give their kids medication vacations during the summer where they say, I don't care if you're focused. I don't care if you got a long attention span. I just need you to go be a kid, play outside. Don't come see me till the sun goes down. And so the kids get a break from their medication from any of the side effects that it has or just the stigma that it has for those kids who are aware of, of what they're taking and why they're taking it. And so this is the time of year where people are like, I got to got to get everybody back on their medicine because then we're headed back to school and we don't need all of the readjustment to doses on certain things happening during the first few weeks of school. So it always happens the few weeks before. And those are the things that, that we start seeing. Parents start getting concerned about, I've got to have this for school and the school nurse has to have this and I've got to have this yeah. documentation for and the I teacher and they have to keep this on their file. Yeah, and you got to sign like this whole agenda concept. Like they, we didn't have that <laughs> when I was in school. So like reading the agenda, if I have to tell the teacher anything, I have to write it in the agenda, all those things. So that's a whole new world um, to me with my daughter going to kindergarten. But then I see the parents and like the frantic, deer and headlights appearance that they right. come they're like coming to the pharmacy they're like we're going back to school what do I do and <laughs> so, so I was like I don't remember how to do this like they're in the eighth grade and I don't remember how to do this <laughs> just because like summer we just like stop thinking about stuff a lot of times right and so um so one of the things that and there's a lot of things that came into my mind when I started thinking about, about back to school um and they're kind of all scattered because they cover a whole wider range of things. But one of the first things that comes to my mind as a pharmacist that I get asked a hundred times is I've got to have a labeled bottle for school mm -hmm. for the medicine they have to take at school. Whether it's um, the label that goes on an EpiPen that stays in their bag or with the school nurse or the label for the bottle of Benadryl that goes in their bag or goes to the school nurse, the, um, whether it's like an ADD med, like Adderall, Vivance, something like that, um, that they may take in the middle of the day. I see lots right. of directions say, take this one in the morning before you get on the bus. And then you have to take this one at lunch to get you through the rest of the day. And so those doses, one, there's a lot of regulation that surrounds those types of medications. But then 
the school nurse, it, they, it has to be labeled. It can't just be like, here's a baggie of medicine. Right. Like this right. is Monday through Friday. Here you go. So being able to provide that from the pharmacy and any pharmacy can provide you with an extra label, an extra bottle. We're not allowed to split up the medication really. Um, right. And there may be some pharmacists that would, but it becomes very uncomfortable if your medicine is leaving the pharmacy in two separate containers for some reason, because if somebody sees it and finds it like finds one, but not the other one, then, then say may think something's wrong. See, so, and that, um, just for my my own information to know, I, for years I had our pediatrician write a separate doses, you know, just enough dose of some different medications to keep at school. But then that also became a conflict with insurance companies if they've already given you your monthly. So right. now do they just usually streamline it that you guys will give out a separate label and then we mm -hmm. just you out of that bottle and you label it as to what just one dose of it is is that what happens with that so generally when you if you get a normal prescription mm -hmm. from the pharmacy you're right. gonna get pills in a bottle and then the label on the outside of the bottle is gonna have a bunch of legally required information on it your name your address the medication right. name and strength and form is it a tablet or a capsule what the directions are in clear, plain, simple English. Put, put one tablet in your mouth and swallow it one time a day. Right. You know, something like that. Um, the quantity of it, the number of refills, the doctor's name that gave it to you, and then the pharmacy information has to be on that bottle somewhere. Uh, whether it's the name and the address and the phone number or just the name and the phone number, it has to be late listed on the bottle. And then each prescription is assigned a number. And that's just how we electronically track a bunch of stuff. So, and that's also how insurances are able to track that this is, this is one distinct prescription. And then this other number is a different distinct prescription, especially with medications that can't have refills on it. So that's just all of that electronic digital stuff. So if I can just get a second copy of that label with all of that legally required information, then that is enough information for a school nurse to be able to to utilize that medication. So they're going to the label it the same. You're going to give you the exact same label. You're mm -hmm. just only going to give the school enough for one emergency. Right. So then as as the, the parent, then mm -hmm. it, it becomes your job to then say, well, I need, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, then... Right those go in the bottle and then the weekend pills stay at home or because you're probably going to be taking more doses at school than you are at home. You're just going to take the home doses out Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, right. Sunday, and then keep them at home. Then the rest of them go to school for like the noontime dose or the 2 PM dose or whatever it is. Cause nowadays kids aren't getting out of school until three 30 or later a lot of times. Right. And so that becomes, and it, it's kind of that same rule. I think we talked way back about traveling with prescriptions right. where if you don't want to take all of your medicine with you on your trip of afraid of leaving it behind or losing it on a plane, you've, but you've got to have it labeled. So a pharmacy can always get you a duplicate label on an empty bottle and then you decide how many needs to go in that extra bottle. Okay. Yeah. So, Cause years ago, years ago they used to do it where the doctor could write for the extra script for school where mm -hmm. it was only two tablets or whatever. But I have found over the last few years that that doesn't seem like it works very well. Cause the insurance keeps coming back saying we already refilled that bottle. We're not giving mm -hmm. you any more extras. So, right. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. ends up happening. Um, going, thinking about another issue, like, clearly tablets are really easy because they're very individual and they don't accidentally mm -hmm. blend together. You know, they're just tablets right. are, are single units and it's very easy to, to separate, separate them, them and move it, move them from one bottle to the other or back again. If, you know, if whatever happens and they don't go to school that day, then that one just comes back. So the, um, the difficulty and on multiple levels has to do with if you have a type one diabetic child going to school mm. because depending on what, where they are in their diagnosis and their, their control, then they may still be doing individual injections at school. Okay. So 
in in a school setting and different schools are different ways and I've heard all kinds of stories that that have our wonderful school systems that did it the right way and then school systems that don't have a clue what they're doing and parents are really mm -hmm. having to to put themselves out there to advocate for their children to make sure their children are safe and okay in the in the school's care and right. So is the child going to be giving themselves injections or is the child going to have to go to the nurse every single time they have to have an injection? And sometimes when it comes to young children dealing with diabetes, the in number of injections in a day in the number of hours that they're in school, that's a, that's most of their injections. Right. That's, that becomes a lot. Like you have breakfast and then you got to get an injection and then you go outside and play and you got to go get an injection. Mm -hmm. and then you have lunch and you got to get an injection. And then we have PE class today. So I have to get another injection. And then we have snack before we get on the bus and I have to have an injection before I get on the bus. So that just becomes a major ordeal. Now, once control is kind of level, I've seen so many children thrive on insulin pumps once they reach that level of stability and control with their diagnosis that the insulin pump takes all of the thought process out of their out of their head out of their hands they just know what it does they know what the alarms mean and then but then trying to get a school nurse to understand how this pump works and how it's supposed to be just like an organ inside your body except it's not it's an electronic trying to get a school nurse and an administration to understand that can be very difficult. And right. so, and then what do you do? Then you have to have an emergency kit. What happens if the blood sugar is too low and not too high? What do we do? You can't eat candy in class. That'll get you in trouble. So right. all of the balances that go into that. So then being able to have a supply of needles to go to school and a supply of needles to stay at home or a supply of insulin that's going to go in an ice pack to school or stay in the nurse's refrigerator plus the insulin that you have to keep at home um, in case an extra dose is required or a reservoir has to be refilled or whatever has to happen. So that becomes another ordeal of, with especially with the insurance, trying to get enough medicine that we can say, this is how many units of insulin you use a day but you're using some of it at school and some of it at home. So we're not going to be taking the bottle back and forth. We need to leave one in one place and the other one in the mm -hmm. other place. So trying to convince the insurance that you need some extra for some reason can be very difficult. And I, um, I, I, there's actually a patient that we care for on a regular basis that has multiple complications um, that she's had since birth. And so one, she's in a situation where she is not cognizant enough to be able to care for herself okay. on, on the level that is her actual biological age. So she, with her mental capacity delayed and her physical gross motor capacity delayed, plus being a type one diabetic, though, like those parents deserve awards for what they have to do for her but I remember when she first got diagnosed because she had epilepsy due to her her um her delayed and um reduced cognitive function but then when the seizures escalated they're like what's going on and come to find out the seizures were caused by the blood sugar um okay. due to due to an undiagnosed type 1 diabetes so once that got under control, then her seizures returned to baseline. And generally, if seizures um, increase, then it generally has something to do with her blood sugar control, not necessarily the epilepsy control. So that becomes a whole ordeal. And the doctor wanted her to use the insulin pins, like the, the where you screw the needle on and it's right. like you're having to draw it out of a vial. And right. the insurance was really ugly about it because it required her to have a certain number of extra pins because some had to go to school with her in her bag and some had to stay home. Mm -hmm. And so that became, that becomes a battle that parents are fighting on all fronts. And if you got a good pharmacist and you've got a good specialist and a good pediatrician, they're going to go to bat for you. Um, cause I remember all the documentation that we had to send in for her and we finally got it worked out. So she has adequate medication for school and home and she's not running out in one place before she runs out at the other one and, and her refills stay consistent. So but, would you say like for someone in that situation, if there is someone with type, you know, type one 
and they're having kind of issues getting enough for school, enough for home, so that it's accessible, accessible to you know the nursing staff as well as having it in the home setting. Would you say to go to your pediatrician as well as your pharmacist, having them making documentation to send into insurance companies? What do you think is the best way, I guess, to navigate through that for parents to kind of streamline that to make sure they have enough of what they need at both school and home? Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of times what ends up happening is when we run a prescription to insurance at the pharmacy, mm -hmm. our, the systems are set up for prescription insurances that we get an instantaneous response from the insurance. Is it going to be covered? Is it not going to be covered? What's your copay? And so sometimes the insurance will send us some type of information or some type of clue in the rejection information that we get on the on the medication that allows us to troubleshoot what what's happening. So okay. if a pediatrician or a specialist or a pediatric endocrinologist sends in a prescription and the insurance rejects it, then the pharmacist and the pharmacy staff, because I've got technicians that can translate insurance almost better than I can sometimes. So it's not just on the pharmacist, but the, the team in the pharmacy filling your medication, they're going to be the ones to be able to translate that and see what type of troubleshooting situations there are. Um, sometimes it may be that the doctor, even though the doctor's trying to measure the insulin, like to the, to the teeny tiniest measurement to get mm -hmm. it exactly right, Sometimes the doctors may need to write the prescription with a with kind of a bubble that gives you a little extra just in case. Um, you don't ever think about that, but there's all kinds of things like what happens if I spill it? What happens if I can't get the dose to come out and it gets wasted on the floor? The all kinds right. of things. So if right. you just take it, take a logical look at it and say, if we extend it out and give a little bit of a bubble not saying that you have a whole lot of permission to take extra, but we've got a little bit of a bubble that then allows your supply for the one month or whatever time frame the insurance is covering. Then the maximum for that one month becomes a little bit more and you can usually eke it in there. Okay. Um, so a lot of times the pharmacy is going to be the first place. Like clearly the doctor is making the clinical decisions of this is the best way and the best medicine to take care of your child in the situation. So then when it goes to the pharmacy and runs to the insurance, the pharmacy team is going to be the ones to figure out what the insurance wants and try to figure out how to get the medicine you need while still making the insurance happy. Okay. And then, then the pharmacist as a professional can consult with the doctor and his staff or her staff to say, this is what the insurance wants. If you can get me an edited prescription in this fashion, it's going to work. Or okay. if you do a prior authorization with these reasons behind it, it's going to work. So, so I'm all of that together. working together is going to be able, because as a pharmacist, I can't do a prior authorization. I can just say, hey, these are the steps that have to be taken. The doctor's staff have to be the one to submit that documentation because okay. they've got all the progress notes from appointments and stuff like that. So, okay. um, but generally, if, you're, if you get the information, it's not covered by your insurance, then you ask why, and the pharmacy team is going to be able to try to translate why, and then, then go to the doctor to see yes, what, um, if they're a good pharmacist and a good pharmacy team, they're going to take the step to contact the doctor rather than telling you to call your doctor. So, right. Um, Cause you may, resolve not, that. you may not know what you're asking for or be like, I'm just quoting from my pharmacist, like word for word that, you know, that's not, that's not a real yeah. good way to do that, but We're not effective that way. And that's working the, well together. You, the pharmacist will be able to consult the doctor or the doctor's staff to say, this is what we need to get it covered. Can you get it to me? And right. generally the answer is going to be yes. And that goes back to the fact of how we always talk about making sure that you have a great medical team, that it's all about mm -hmm. building your team over time so that you have all of those avenues. Um, yeah. Now, I know obviously um, type one is really big and it's a, it's a huge issue for at school for kiddos that are dealing with mm -hmm. that. But another huge issue, and this has been all over um, the media as well, is the EpiPen crisis. Mm -hmm. And so I think that has a lot of different layers. Um, I know we kind of chatted about it a little bit before. 
Um, but all of us that need an EpiPen, obviously school starts, your mm -hmm. EpiPen is going to expire. You have the year on it. You go to get your new script and now they're saying, we have this shortage. We don't, you know, have enough EpiPens. And, um, you know, for those who don't deal with anaphylactic food allergies, I mean, it is a matter of life and death. And I think that until you have a loved one, a child that has, ex you know, experienced that, the mm -hmm. urgency of it is um, you kind of feel crippled in the sense if you do not have any epinephrine with you I mean, right. everywhere you go because you know that in the instance if something happens, how are you going to save them in enough right. time? Mm -hmm. you know? And so can you kind of break that down? So what's going on with the EpiPen and um, how can we navigate through this in the safest manner? Oh, sure. So EpiPen, unfortunately, has been in the news a lot. Mm -hmm. One, back when the, the price hike happened and there was just this monopoly on this and they weren't allowing generic companies to like chip in and make some equivalents. And then they got so much bad press. They were like, well, all right, mm -hmm. we'll let our sister company make a approved generic. Mm -hmm. um, so with both brand and generic coming from the same source because they're sister companies, then, then that puts a lot of pressure on the supplier having to supply double versus just, just one chain and down to one business. So I think through all of that time and then them trying to have adequate stock, there has become a raw material supply um, shortage, which then means the companies making it can't make them fast enough or in large enough quantities to get them out to everyone. So unfortunately, EpiPens and the generic equivalents that, that were available at the time are on back order. We're looking, the last dates that we got were somewhere between October and December. So that's kind of a good amount of time from now. And that's kind of a big window for them to be able to say, well, we might be able to get it to you before Christmas. Um, but I don't know if I want to trust them on that because right. sometimes we've seen back orders get pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. So, so what the FDA has allowed in this situation is that certain lot numbers of the EpiPen, and as far as I can tell at this moment, it's only for the brand name EpiPens. So if you had the epinephrine 0.3 by myelin, then that may not be included in this um, set of lot numbers and uh, in this permissions, but the brand name EpiPens are having, per they've been granted permission to extend the expiration dates on certain lot numbers. And so on the FDA website, you can probably Google it if you wanted to, okay. um, about EpiPen extended expiration dates, and you'd find the, the link or an article that then links you back to the original FDA list um, where there's a chart of all the lot numbers that are involved and what the new expiration dates are. So because we've always been told that even if you have an expired EpiPen, as long as it hasn't been too hot or too cold or damaged or dropped or thrown against the wall in any way, even if it's expired, we want you to try to use it because it's a matter of life and death. Right. So, so now here we are, they've been able to provide, because here's the thing, manufacturers do crazy amounts of testing on their drugs and unfortunately, it's one of the crutches that they use as an excuse to allow them to make their prices so high, but they really do an extensive amount of testing on their drugs. So they put an expiration date on there because that's the date that they say we can guarantee stability and shelf life and potency on this, on this drug. Mm -hmm. No matter how you treat it, this, right. we, we can guarantee it up until this point. So really stable medications, have really long, ha really long expiration dates. More fragile medications or hormone-based medications or injectable medications may have a shorter, shorter expiration date on it just because they're more fragile in their nature as a drug. Right. So, but they do a ridiculous amount of testing and documentation to say really and truly, if this sat in a dark closet, how long can it sit there before it truly will not work Same anymore. Work. Yeah. And so, and so they keep all that documentation in, in their files. Cause I've had to go into the pharmacy and be like, 
hi, you know, Pfizer. <laughs> Oh, I had this drug. It got left in the hot sun. This is what it, you know, this are all the situations mm -hmm. or I'm not sure what might've happened to it. Can you give me like any kind of promise that this is going to happen? I've also had it with, happen with like, especially with injectables that have to be refrigerated. It right. sat out on the counter for 18 hours, but it was only 75 degrees in the room the entire time that it was on the counter and the lights were off and whatever, whatever. And then they can like type it all into their little algorithm and tell and me, can see. yes, it's still good or no, it's not, or it's only going to be good for 14 more days. And then you have to trash it no matter what. So, so those are, they have that documentation. So this is where the FDA says, this is a crisis that is affecting a lot of people's lives, not just making them uncomfortable, but making it dangerous for them to, and like threatening their survival. Right. So you need to dig into your database and tell me what's the maximum you can put on this. So these people can, can feel safe mm -hmm. as they're living their life while you're trying to solve this problem. And so, so that's where the list comes from. It may not be every lot number out there available, but it's going to be the, the ones that they've got current data on that they can say for sure are going to be okay past that. Um, the other option, and this is where your, your healthcare team with your pharmacist and your doctors may really have to work together, is that there is another auto injector product out there made by a different company. It's called AviQ. And okay. it's an auto injector. It is a voice directed auto injector. So somebody who doesn't know anything about using auto injectors can turn it on and it'll tell you what to do. And you can save your own life or you can save your child's life or you can save your neighbor's life that you don't know mm -hmm. from Adam's house cat, but they have an obby cue and it can tell you what to do. So that's, that's mm -hmm. a really cool product, but insurances don't like to pay for it. Right. Because obviously it has a voice activation feature on it and everything. <laughs> yeah. When, yeah. You know, oh my gosh. You know, I did find that. Trauma. This is crazy. <laughs> you know, cause my son obviously has had this since, you know, he was about six months old, you know, and since he's mm -hmm. been a baby, he's been allergic to a ton of different things. And, um, years ago, Go, when you got the pens, you got one pen and the written instruction. And now over the years, now you get the double pen and Plus the tester and you get the trainer. Yeah. The trainer to do it where years ago, they didn't have the trainer that you could show people how to utilize it and mm -hmm. stamp it into your leg. And you don't realize, you don't realize how hard you have to like slam it into somebody mm -hmm. to get that to activate and that injection, to, that injection right. to go in. So it really allows you to feel the mechanics of right. it and, and know, because for some people, your own adrenaline ramps up and then you're just going to like slam somebody and it's just going to be, be painful <laughs> or you're going to break the device and then you're in a mess. Or there's going to be people who are really anxious and, and nervous and timid about it. And then you're like trying to do an injection and it's, and it's not going to work. So, right. so those testers are so important for, for if you've got of age children who could be able to manage this themselves for them to practice, what does it feel like if I have to slam this into my leg? Um, and right. then, and then you as a parent and then siblings and friends and grandma right. and, and everybody for training else, for schools and everything. To practice. Yeah. <laughs> with that, but but like? my thought with that is how much money it has costed. I mean, think about that, that 20 years ago, mm -hmm. you got one pen, no trainer and written instructions. Yeah. <laughs> Now you get two pens and then the, a trainer, and mm -hmm. then you're talking about another brand now that actually voice activates it to you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I obviously with rising costs of everything, that's part of the issue here, you know, as well. So mm -hmm. I know you said for that, you're going to, we're going to drop the link so that if people don't mm -hmm. want to look it up, they'll be able to look at that. Yeah. But I'll get you the, I'll get you the direct link to the FDA list of all of the approved lot numbers. So whatever you got in the closet and the, under the bed and whatever, Mm -hmm. um, that you've stashed, check your lot numbers against that list so you can update your dates and see, cause, um, even at, like we talked, we were talking about this before we started that EpiPens aren't just for the families. Your school nurses are required to have them in their kits for, for anything. So if your school nurses can't get access to the EpiPens, that they need to have on hand for maybe an unsuspecting child that doesn't know about allergies. Right, it doesn't that know they have an allergy. Discovered it because we had something at lunch that you just never had at home because 
picky eaters or whatever. So that just becomes a thing that nurses have to have them. Um, for us in the pharmacy, I can't vaccinate unless I have an EpiPen and other particular items in an emergency kit for somebody who may be unsuspecting or have an unexpected reaction to a vaccine that I give. And that's one of the liabilities that I have. And that's one of the um, things that I've had to go through training to make sure I'm certified for. But if my EpiPen is expired and we can't keep it for any reason and I have nothing available, then I can't, vac I can't vaccinate my patients. And that puts my patient population at risk. That allows them to that causes them to lose trust in me and then mm -hmm. who knows you know what the snowball effect of that is if we don't have this so um so i'm grateful that this early on in the situation you know it's been a couple of months since we haven't been able to get the EpiPen, but the fda has really stepped up to say you need to check your books and figure out what we can do to make sure that the products that they have right. we can guarantee that they're safe and that these these the, the the survival of these people and these citizens is going to be protected at all costs. So, right. so if you got that list, if that's not going to be the, the answer to our, to your problem, then the AviQ is an option where doctors can write it. Pharmacists can assist doctors in submitting the prior authorization information. Again, if it's not covered, what do they want? You got to have some kind of documentation about diagnosed with this right. number of allergies for this number of years, EpiPen this many times a year, whatever. And then, you know, they're, they're probably going to start approving it through insurances because of the shortage. And they, they understand insurances it's called health insurance, but really they're in the money insurance business because mm -hmm. they're trying to insure their own money to keep stay in their pockets. So mm -hmm. if it's cheaper for them to pay for the AviQ than it is to pay for you to have to go to the hospital and receive fluids yep. and breathing medicine and steroids and IV epinephrine and be in the hospital for four days because like some brush by contact with something, then then it's cost effective for them to to start paying for it right, until right. the shortage is has recovered enough that we can trust that it's going to be okay um and the supply is going to be sufficient for the long term so right. so it really is one of those things that um that we've seen if if doctors or their their staff can write a very compelling prior authorization argument for an appeal insurance will, co will start covering things um that they that they may not not, not always cover. Yeah. And so I know that you spoke to giving flu shots and I know it's not quite flu season mm -hmm. yet. Not yet. Um, it's but, still summertime in Georgia. <laughs> and it's still summertime here. I'm hoping that summer lasts though here in Wisconsin till like December. Um, I don't know if that's going to be my luck. <laughs> so I know we'll be back on a show before then and I'll be complaining about the snow. <laughs> Um, but vaccination updates, flu shots, what is your thought on that going into the school year, people being ready, when to get those? Mm -hmm. What's your feedback yeah. on that? I mean, clearly the CDC has very, um, detailed schedules for pediatric vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a lot of it. Um, when it comes to your really young babies who aren't immune to anything yet and the number of mm -hmm. vaccines they have to get, it really can pull on a mama's heartstrings to say, you got to give her how many shots this time around? Can we not spread those mm -hmm. out? And, um, and as you know, making personal choices of how you vaccinate your children um, is, is always something that, that you should make decisions on as an educated parent and not really right. based on arguments from anyone or pressure from anyone else. But that schedule is laid out for a reason. And, um, and I even had to rush my daughter, like we went to kindergarten open house and then I had to take her to the doctor to get her last polio shot. And then two days later she started school. So then I could say, if you, if you check our, because I don't know if every state has this, but Georgia has a, has a system called GRITS, which is the Georgia Registration for Immunization Tracking. And, um, and so I was like, if you check GRITS, that polio shot is going to be in there. She's caught up. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to send a letter home with me about, about her not having all her shots. So even I was rushing at the last minute to get, to get all the vaccines done. Mm -hmm. but, but that schedule is clearly laid out. 
with, with making sure all of that is up to date. Um, and I know a lot of people are in a lot of situations and I understand that the variety of, of difficulty that can go into special needs children, that mm -hmm. there may be children in your family or in your child's class that have some true medical reason that they can't receive a vaccine. Right. And therefore it becomes my job as a healthy citizen and my children being healthy citizens to get their vaccines. So maybe the, the, the citizens who are around them, but aren't as healthy as them or have a roadblock in, in their health that doesn't allow them to receive vaccines, they're still going to be safe because that means my child's not going to be carried around some disease that's going to like catch somebody else. Now, right. I've already had the kindergarten cold and we had to get ear infection medicine and all that stuff. So kids, when they get crammed into a room together are going to share germs. Right. So, so whether it's protecting your children with the vaccines and helping protect their classmates who, who may be in a situation um, where their immunity or just their lot of genetics that they receive does not make them capable of getting those vaccines, then, then my, at least my child is going to be part of the protection mechanism against those that may have weaker immune systems or have limitations. So then if you have children in your family with limitations, then it's important for everyone else in the family to be right. vaccinated for all of the things, including the flu, so that the the member of your tribe that can't be vaccinated is going to be as protected as possible right. and so so that becomes another thing of that it's not just about your student making sure they're up to date on their vaccines but making sure the entire family the entire village that's helping raise your children are also vaccinated and up to date so tetanus pertussis flu shot all of those things mm -hmm. but then and the other thing comes to with all of the Jeremy children in the classroom, um, you know, we all work really hard to teach our children to wash their hands and to like cough into their elbow and all of those things. Right. And they're probably not going to remember all of that stuff until they're grown <laughs> um, or who knows when. But then um, I'm a big fan of alcohol based hand sanitizer, which sounds mm -hmm. ridiculous, but like, hospitals and businesses and shopping malls and banks and all kinds of places have those little dispensers on the wall. So mm -hmm. teaching my children to use it. Um, my, my kindergartner is very sound sensitive and she hates the hand blowers in the bathrooms. Okay. And so if we go into a bathroom like that, that has a hand blower and they don't have a towel dispenser, she will not wash her hands. So I'm all about having like pocket hand sanitizer. Be like, here, baby, this one smells like peppermint. Like, we're, you know, just rub it together and, and we're going to keep on going because I want her hands to be clean and especially for using a public restroom and in a very public place where you've got lots of people all huddled together, especially once the weather starts changing and they're not going to be playing outside as much. Um, that really does become an important thing of using hand sanitizer. If I'm going to give my teachers anything on their school supply list, you're getting triple hand sanitizer <laughs> because like, it's like, here's one, here's one thing of paper and here's one thing of crayons and here's five bottles of Germex because all of the germs that everybody has. Um, and even with all of that, it, you know, she still got a cold, but she's getting over it and it's fine. And I think that just kind of happens from when they're, at home around everybody they're used to being mm -hmm. around and now they're around a whole bunch of new people. Um, germs spread really quickly. Right. And then, um, then the probiotics probiotics is another one of my favorite things to really help boost my children's immunity. Okay. Um, especially when I have picky eaters because she started kindergarten and she just thinks it's the best thing. Like she loves it. Mom, I had a great day today. Okay. I'm so proud, baby. Like tell me all about it. But then if she's not eating the stuff at lunch or she's kind of having that positive peer pressure where her friends are mm -hmm. eating school lunch. So now she wants to eat school lunch, but you're thinking she's never tried before. I don't need a whole lot of issues going on. So if, if I can keep 
and probiotics are advertised mostly for digestion anyway, mm -hmm. but if I've got picky eaters and she's actually willing to try new foods, then I don't want it to ruin the experience for her because it was something her system wasn't used to digesting and then it, it leading to, uh, and causing her some discomfort. Okay. Um, and so having the probiotic in her system really does kind of boost that, that digestion to be able to say, you know, I know that that's at least going to be as working smoothly as it possibly can so that then anything that she encounters when I'm not there, whether it's trying new foods or just germs from friends and playing on the playground with a hundred other people, though her immune system is at least going to be boosted as much as it can. Now, do you do that through like a gummy chew, a food, a vitamin or a, you know, like something that you add to foods? Because, I mean, obviously I see probiotics in all different forms. So yeah, for kids, we just do it in the gummies. She chews, the gummies. Like, she chews her multivitamin, she chews her probiotics. And so that, that's that been the easiest way, especially okay. since, like, she doesn't have any swallowing issues or, or texture issues when it comes to, like, I mean, at least not really. I guess she does have some right. texture issues, but not not to the point. Like there are some children who, for one reason or another, whether it's compounded with something um, more widespread or global in their system or not, may have texture problems. And chewing a gummy medicine is not right. going to fly. Would not be, yeah, um, would not you be. know, if you've got if you've got autistic children for whatever reason, and they're super picky about like I'm only going to eat the lemon ones, and I can only have you know, it has to be this particular texture and this particular color, mm -hmm. you know, all of those particular things that happen in a children's sensory system that make them very picky about what goes in their mouth, then that may not be the way to go. You may have to use one of the powdered kinds and, and hide it in something that they will eat. Right. Uh, but at least for, for my girls, they can, they'll do the chewy ones, the little gummy probiotics, um, Those seem to work. Walgreens good. used to make one that was called a yogurt probiotic, and so they were kind of big gumdrop shaped, and they were like a creamy. It was like a creamy strawberry and a creamy banana, and a the the other one was orange. Um, and and I can't find them anymore. <laughs> the last time I went, the last time I went in to look for them, they had like one of those clearance stickers on them. And so I was like, uh, does that mean that you're phasing them out? Or like, I don't know what happened. Um, really? and so I just had to get like the regular ones. So I was kind of bummed. They really liked those, but they were also really big. So my three-year-old was having to like eat it in like three bites because it was just too big. <laughs> um, but, but like, that's just kind of, when I look at all the different things that we can do and the choices that we can make to, to boost their immune system and keep them protected from germs, um, you know, that's kind of a, a three pronged thing of saying, we're going to be vaccinated against the things that we know can make you really sick. And it makes you miss school days. And then it's contagious to other people. And then keeping your hands clean, using hand sanitizer, because with hand sanitizer, you don't need water and it dries right. all by itself. My three year old going like this drying her hands um, when the hand sanitizer starts to cool on her after she's rubbed it together. But, you know, that's something now schools may be particular about them carrying it on their person, but it's one of those things if, if we're keeping our teachers adequately supplied with hand sanitizer when they ask for it, um, and, and the student, your student is learning to, to use it, be like, um, I just got back from the bathroom. I'm going to wash my hands. I'm going to lunch. I'm going to wash my hands. And then I keep a stash in the car be like, Hey, welcome home. Tell me all about your day. Hand sanitizer. So, um, just, just to try to keep the germs at bay and it has less hand sanitizer has less of the negative press as like the antibacterial soap one with soap. Then I risk my children playing in the water and flooding the bathroom and that I try to avoid. But then, um, just the, the, the details and the data that's coming out about certain bacteria, um, even your normal flora, um, leaving, living on your skin, being hump, becoming resistant to the antibacterial ingredients in the soap to where that, as long as they stay in their happy place, they're not a big deal. But if that resistant bacteria gets into an unhappy place, then you, you end up with a super infection and don't really mean to. So, so avoiding the antibacterial soap, if I can, and using hand sanitizer 
um, that's alcohol based and then boosting their immune system from the inside, digestive health and skin health, oral health, all of those things with probiotics, um, really giving, giving them that boost um, to make sure that no matter what they encounter, if they decide to eat the dirt on the playground, <laughs> they're going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, because the, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be aware of, of their immune system on the inside and out. So. Yes. And that is definitely what we need when we do, in, we, when we do encounter all of those germs <laughs> as the kids start school and they bring them home as well. Yeah. So, you know, I know that we cover the EpiPens, um, also type one, um, our labeling in the school bottles, our probiotics, our hand sanitizers, our vaccinations, our flu shots. Is there anything else that you would like to give a reminder about to parents as we all embark on this new 2018 to 2019 school year? Um, I feel like I feel like you covered a lot. Yeah, it, I mean, it really is. <laughs> Some of it, I've just, I've had to think about it myself because I sent her to kindergarten. I'm like, what is happening? How did this even happen? She's about to be six. I'm just, <laughs> um, but one of the things that even with, um, if they get that first week of school cold or their allergies set off because there's different dusts and molds and things in the school than they're used to dealing with at home, those kinds of things. Um, being very aware of what medications your children takes that can make them drowsy. Okay. Um, because a, a drowsy kid at school is going to be unpleasant for everyone involved. The kid's gonna be unhappy because they prefer to be napping. The teacher's going to be unhappy because they think that the child is falling asleep and not paying attention and being rebellious or, or subordinate in some way. Then that disrupts the whole class. So then their classmates are not enjoying their day. And generally, if you have a, a sleepy child that you're trying to keep awake, they end up really cranky. So then that, that becomes, that just becomes a perpetual cycle of then they're cranky, then they're lashing out at their teacher. So now they really are being subordinate and rebellious. And then it just becomes, it becomes a major problem. So, so being aware of saying, if I'm, if we're having to start a new allergy medicine, is the allergy medicine going to make them drowsy or not? Is it best to give it to them in the morning before they go or in the evening before right. they go to sleep that night? Um, so that it's on board for the morning. Yeah. If you're having to deal with, with a child with a cold and then they, they, they've got the sniffles and you, they, they don't have a fever. There's no reason to keep them home, but they need to go to school, but you don't want them like being gross. Then choosing, like choosing to give them something, is it going to be something that makes them drowsy, like a Dimetap or, or a children's Triaminic or something like that, that's going to have a drowsy ingredient in it. That's really going to ruin their school day, whether they were sick or not. Um, that ha, being aware of those things. Yeah, just being cognizant um, of it. Yeah, trying to use those things to help them sleep better at night and being comfortable and then possibly using um, homeopathic or naturopathic um, products during the day when you have to send them to school. So um, so with Jocelyn, I use the, I'm a big fan of the Zerabee's honey syrup. Mm -hmm. um, that's for like the cough and the mucus. So it doesn't, those ingredients don't have anything drowsy related to them. So I, she can take those during the day, go to school, and then it lasts her most of the school day. And then she gets home. So being aware of what you can use and what you can and finding alternatives that's going to avoid the drowsiness at school. Right. And if for whatever reason, if they are sick enough that the medication that they have to take is going to cause them to be drowsy, then try to find a way for them to, to stay at home and rest and then make up their work because the makeup work is going to be a lot easier than mm -hmm. the Pandora's box of bad behavior that may come out of them going to school on a medication that causes them to be drowsy. Right. Um, and, and your younger kids are going to be more sensitive to that than, than maybe your middle schoolers and high schoolers and stuff. But, um, but we know that tired children at school don't learn and it makes the classroom experience a very negative one. Hungry children at school becomes a very negative experience for that child and for their classmates at school. Um, and so, um, so while when they're well, making sure that they're getting a good night's sleep, if they're, 
fighting a, a cold or a virus just or the allergies, making sure that if you're having to medicate them to go to school for those things that you're not using medications that cause drowsiness. And then, um, and then just, I'm, I'm, I'm working really hard to make sure my picky eater is well fed when, when she goes to school. Cause I know when she's hungry, she's cranky and you can't survive right, on gold. Not thinking as much. That's not gonna, that's not gonna fly. So, you know, those are kinds of the things of paying attention to, to what's going on and, and being aware of, of the child's demeanor of, what they giving them the best jumping off point for succeeding in their class and, right. and not being for a success and not yeah um because anything that's going to cause them to be cranky is then just going to ruin it for everyone and then if they right. have to do recess and then all of this stuff so it just it's just it just becomes a downward spiral so avoiding it in the first hand of if you have to medicate them for for something acute or short term like allergies or a cold um picking something that's going to eliminate the drowsy factor, at least during the school day, and then using something that may have a little bit of drowsy effect at night. So night that you can sleep well. too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They can sleep. I can sleep. We're, you know, we're all going to be fine. Um, that's, right. that's, that's one of the things that I've, I feel like that's some advice I've had to give in person a lot to say, he's got to go to school. I don't know which one to choose. I'd be like, that one it's not going to make him sleepy so um so those are those are hard decisions and at least for for me my age like i i grew up taking dimetap for like everything that ailed me just about Mm -hmm. and so it so it kind of becomes like that that go-to like i remember Mm -hmm. that it still exists so um but but making wise choices about medications that are going to cover the symptoms but also medications that aren't going to have side effects that will negatively affect their success in their school day, especially in the right. beginning when you, when it, it becomes very sensitive, are they going to love it? Or are they going to hate it? Um, we, we don't want the, the allergies and the cold and the medications going along mm-hmm. with those things to, to tip them towards really despising going to school and, right. and, and hating the experience. Right. And having that be another layer. And for parents, I think that all the topics that you talked about tonight are so relevant for many of us that have to fill out the medical forms and the prescription forms and have mm-hmm. all that. Also to just, you know, be very, very mindful that if your child maybe doesn't have a medication that they're taking every single day at school, but they do get a cold that you don't want things that do make them drowsy because the whole thing is, is that we want to set our kiddos up for success each right. Every day, and by having their medical stuff ready, them being well rested, getting sleep, um, mm-hmm. and having the right supplies, and all of that stuff gets them fully prepared and ready. And I wanted to speak to when you talked about the hand sanitizer. That woman that is on social media kept coming up in my head. <laughs> shopping through Target, I just want her you want to know that teacher, I love her. I'll get you a rug. <laughs> I love because that's the truth. Our teachers deserve so many props yeah. for everything. They take in and educate our kids every single day, and there's nothing that they put on a list that should be trying to any of us to make sure that they have. And so, I'm happy to know that you'll buy them five hand sanitizers, <laughs> <laughs> and they'll be they'll be good to go. They can share them. But I, I do know that for a lot of the kids now, I do see. They have the hand sanitizers that like snap onto your backpack. Oh yeah, they've got on. the little the little clip thing that'll hang on the outside. Yeah, yeah. which is which is awesome um, for them to have along with them. So yeah, sure. with that, I know that you're gonna drop some links below. Mm-hmm so that we can, we have some other resources. Um, but I say thank you so much for coming on tonight and sharing all this great back to school info with us. Um, it's been a bit since we've gotten to, since we've gotten to talk and I can't believe yeah, my you're... summer, my summer was a whirlwind. <laughs> Not even. And now your little one in kindergarten. So everyone's off to school and my youngest is starting college. And so it's a little bit different, but I'm going to make sure that everybody's got hand sanitizers. So <laughs> we're all going to be good. We're all going to be good. So on that note, thank you so much, Cynthia, for being with us again yeah. tonight. Um, if anybody wants to check out your podcast, it's absolutely awesome. Can you give them the details on that real quick? 
Yeah, sure. The Facebook page is the Pharmacist Answers Podcast. You can also find the entire library of the podcast, plus extra blog posts that I've written on intelleximed.com. That's I-N-T-E-L-L-E-X-I-M-E-D.com, intelleximed.com. So yeah, and, and there I, is every I, topic there. Ben Hendrix everywhere else that you can imagine. So <laughs> Um, so we will drop that below as well. So you guys can check that out because uh, is it about every couple of weeks that you put up a new one on different medications, cold symptoms, all that kind of stuff? Um, it was for a while. Like I said, my summer was a whirlwind and that would be like a whole nother hour topic okay. about, um, <laughs> going through, going through a pharmacy merger and like tripling my pharmacy business and trying not to drown or die or <laughs> crawl up in the corner and cry. So, um, so I haven't even like, like barely, I've barely seen my own face in the last, since, since the middle of June. So it's kind but of, but you got a lot, you got a lot of great content yeah, on there. So you yeah, there's, on there's a huge library there. I've got, um, a podcast. I've got a, there's an episode on probiotics that people seem to love. I've got pro I've got, um, episodes about like cold versus flu and some vaccine information. So, so a lot of the things that we talked about, um, as some of the basics, those episodes are like tried and true. They're, they're out there. So. Right. And those are whole episodes just on those topics. So mm -hmm. yeah. So they're like 15 to 30 minutes long. So right. a real, a real easy listen for you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for being on tonight and sharing part of your yeah. evening with us. Thanks thank you all me. again for um, tuning in to the Honor Advocate. If you want to find out any more about any of our podcasts, YouTube tutorial videos, or any of the other services that we offer over at the Honor Advocate, you can go to onairadvocate.com. Also, if you want to become part of our private community, you can just go to the top of this Facebook page, hit the blue button that says visit group. And that's a place where we can chat and communicate each and every day. So on that note, everybody, Everybody have a great evening. Thanks again, Cynthia. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.